Many wondered why Freddie Mercury kept his illness a secret, especially when speaking out could have helped others. But the real reason for his silence is utterly heartbreaking. With a stunningly powerful voice and an onstage presence to match, it's not an overstatement to say that Freddie Mercury was one of the greatest rock frontmen of all time. But behind the scenes, Mercury's life was wildly different than what fans saw. From secret pain and heartache to controversy to the jaw-dropping tragedy of his untimely death, Mercury's story isn't for the faint of heart. The man we know as Freddie Mercury was actually born Farouk Balsara in British colonial Zanzibar in East Africa. While they were originally from Western India, Freddie's father worked for the British colonial office, which meant that their lives could be upended at any moment, and often they were. It seems like Freddie's upbringing, formed of years spent in colorful exotic places, would later play a huge part in his dazzling and flamboyant public image. In fact, there's concrete evidence he was born to be a singer. Mercury was born with four extra incisors, and this resulted in a different shape of mouth, which acted almost like an amplifier for his voice. But while Mercury had the talent and aptitude, he didn't necessarily have the attitude. Freddie Mercury was a painfully shy child, and the upheaval of his early years certainly didn't help things. He was an only child until the age of seven when his mother gave birth to his little sister, Kashmira. It was a joyful time, but Freddie had a sad surprise in store. His father thought that an education in India would be much better for him, so they sent little Freddie away to a British-style boarding school near Bombay. It was his first time away from his family, and the loneliness must have been crushing. However, it took a lot to keep Freddie Mercury down. Mercury quickly settled in at boarding school, not only taking to his arts classes, but also making a concerted effort at trying a variety of sports and sticking with piano lessons. Just when it seemed like he was adjusting, life threw him another curveball. In 1964, riots broke out in Zanzibar, and his family fled to England. He joined them there, but it was way more of a culture shock than he could have predicted. After spending the first decade and a half of his life in warm, sunny climates with a bustling street life, Freddie Mercury found himself in drab, conservative Feltham, a town a handful of miles outside of London. The consequences were dire. Mercury struggled in all aspects of his life because of the sharp transition, but his schoolwork became a particular problem. Luckily, things in London were about to change in a big way. The era of the swinging 60s was taking full hold in London. Inspiration was everywhere in the form of British acts like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, and records from the US's best black soul artists made their way into local record stores. The Stones and the Who alike had been products of London era art schools, and Mercury set his sights on Ealing Art College, where he studied art and design. His parents weren't exactly thrilled, but Mercury was determined to break free of the drearier side of his new home country. Ultimately, a design program wasn't exactly the arena for Freddie Mercury to express his creative side. While other students worked on package designs for supermarket products, Mercury grew more and more enamored with rock's most bombastic performers, including Jimi Hendrix. While many of his peers looked for jobs at ad agencies and industrial design firms upon graduating, Mercury instead branched out. After leaving Ealing, Mercury finally put himself in a position where he could live and work how he wanted to. In between jobs selling vintage clothing and working as a baggage handler at Heathrow, he joined a series of bands, making friends along the way, even when the groups failed. Two of these friends, Roger Taylor and Brian May, had a group called Smile. Mercury was a big fan, but just that, only a fan. But sometimes, all it takes is one twist of fate to change everything. Smile was fronted by a singer named Tim Staffel, who was a classmate of Mercury's from Ealing. They'd been together for about two years and reached a moderate level of success when Staffel decided he wanted to join another band. At that moment, Mercury knew that he had a golden opportunity and that he had to act on it. He told Taylor and May that they didn't have to go their separate ways just because Smile was over. In fact, he saw himself taking the place of Staffel. Mercury was coming out of his shell, and he wasn't afraid to tell his two bandmates what he thought the direction of their new band should be. For one, he'd be acting as lead singer. Mercury also suggested they call the band Queen. While they were initially reluctant, they eventually came around to the name. While the moniker stuck, he didn't always have the same luck. 
In the early 70s, when Queen was still working on their first album, Mercury embarked on a solo side project under a fake name, looking to glam rock star Glary Glitter for inspiration, or perhaps as an object of mockery, he chose the name Larry Lurex. What seemed like an innocent jab turned into a massive debacle. Glitter's massive fan base turned on Mercury, as did many radio DJs. Freddie went on to great success, while Glitter went on to become a sex criminal, but at the time, it was a catastrophe for Mercury as a newcomer. As Queen performed their very first shows and prepared material for their debut album, they also went through a litany of bass players. And that wasn't their only problem. Label after label rejected them, and it took nearly two years for their management to get EMI to finally pick them up. Finally, three years after Mercury had approached Taylor in May, Queen released its self-titled debut album. The reaction was not what they expected. On Queen, Mercury and the band produced a number of fresh takes on the rock genre, including the now classic Keep Yourself Alive. However, when the album came out, they faced a major disappointment. While they got some favorable reviews, those critics mostly comparing them to Led Zeppelin, other reviews were downright harsh, with one calling it a bucket of urine. On top of that, Radio 1 refused to play it. Still, in those days, record labels were more apt to give a band a second chance, and Freddie knew that this time around, they'd really make it count. Mercury may have put a lot of himself into the band in his musical career, but that didn't mean it was his sole focus in life. Back in 1969, his Queen bandmate Brian May had found himself quite enamored of a young shop assistant named Mary Austin. While it didn't work out between the two, she did catch Freddie Mercury's eye. They waited five long months before going on their first date, but apart from that long courtship, patience wasn't exactly their strong suit. Tall, dark, and handsome, met petite blonde and blue-eyed, and it seemed like a match made in heaven. Soon after Mercury took Austin on their first date, they moved in together, but as the honeymoon period wore off, Austin began to get a bad feeling about things. As the months wore on, Freddie's focus shifted back to the band and his career. Queen may have taken three years to make and release their first album, but that was a pattern that they'd never repeat again. In fact, they were already going full speed ahead recording their second album when Queen came out. The record, Queen 2, came out less than a year after their first, and it was exactly what Freddie had been waiting for. Queen 2 became a big hit in both the UK and stateside, and its success also boosted sales for the band's neglected first album. Critics began to pay more attention to the band and its showy frontman, but for Freddie, all this attention came with a devastating dark side. Journalists began to interrogate Mercury about his personal life and sexuality. Some were more sly about it and others just straight up blunt. Not long after Queen 2 came out, a journalist came out and asked Freddy, so how about being bent? Mercury skillfully eluded a direct answer to the question, instead alluding to schoolboy shenanigans from his earlier years. See, while his persona as a performer was certainly flamboyant, the real Freddie Mercury was a shy and private man. Their incessant questions began to bother him, and he wasn't the only one. As Freddie threw himself more and more into Queen, he neglected his relationship with Mary Austin. Still, they held on to what they'd once had, and in 1973, he proposed to her and she accepted. Over the next few years of their engagement, plans for the wedding never quite worked out, and Austin's suspicions about what Mercury was getting up to behind her back grew. After the success of Queen 2, the band was flying high. However, behind the scenes, things were getting dire. They set off on a disastrous tour where May fell terribly ill and the band had to prematurely go back to the UK. The cancelled tour gave the band extra time to get back into the recording studio, and Mercury and the boys kept up their breakneck pace with their next album, Sheer Heart Attack. The album was an artistic triumph and should have been a huge financial success, but somehow the band was still broke. Something suspicious was going on, and they had to figure out who or what was the cause. The band's manager, Norman Sheffield, had signed up to work with Mercury and Queen when they were nobodies, and had helped them get signed with EMI. When the band realized that something wasn't adding up, they placed the blame on Sheffield. Freddie was the one who felt the sting of betrayal the most, and he decided to pen a song about the experience, not having any idea the chaos it would cause. Freddie Mercury's song, Death on Two Legs, had lyrics so vitriolic that it shocked his fellow band members. Take for example the line, You're a sewer rat decaying in a cesspool of pride. The consequences were disastrous. Even though they never named him, 
Sheffield sued the band for defamation. However, the suit had an unintended effect. It alerted previously unaware fans about who the song's subject was. Ultimately, they settled the lawsuit and Sheffield denied any financial misconduct. Freddie might have been the most flamboyant member, but above all, Queen was a collaborative effort and they all worked together to make their songs, with one major exception. He had been working on what he called the Cowboy Song for nearly a decade, but it took until 1975 for him to bring the song to rehearsals. Freddie and his bandmates were singing for 10 to 12 hours a day and they recorded for three weeks straight, but what they made was absolutely magical. What started as the Cowboy Song ultimately became one of Mercury's greatest achievements, Bohemian Rhapsody. But the world nearly missed out on the song. Record executives told Queen that it was too long to be played on the radio, let alone become a hit. That's when Mercury came up with a plan. Freddie reached out to his friend Kenny Everett, a well-known DJ, and said that he could listen to it, but made him promise not to play it. The winking hint worked, and the DJ began playing snippets of the song, talking about this forbidden song and building up anticipation for the whole thing. Freddie's plan worked. It forced the hand of the label, who then had to put it out as a single. Interviewers tripped all over themselves to ask Freddie about the meaning of the song, but they were in for a big disappointment. Freddie not only refused to say what any of the lyrics were about, but that the band has continued to be secretive about the song's meaning, even decades after Freddie's passing. And it really wasn't the only secret that Freddie was keeping. Bohemian Rhapsody was still at the top of the charts when 1975 became 1976. Sadly, personal turmoil tempered the triumph of such a huge victory for Freddie. He'd been engaged to Mary Austin for three years at this point, but Freddie was hiding a secret that was so much more scandalous than the meaning of a few song lyrics. Mercury had been having an affair with a record executive named David Minns, and he couldn't hide the truth about himself from Austin any longer. It's likely that he was terrified to tell her the truth about his sexuality, but luckily, he was in for a surprise. Though they broke up, the two still remained close friends, and Mercury even bought her a four-bedroom apartment near his home so that they could see each other whenever they wanted. Unfortunately for Mercury, when he went looking for that same unconditional love with other romantic partners, he wouldn't quite find it so easily. Mercury had kept up appearances and hid his affairs with men while he was still with Austin, but once the relationship ended, he jumped full force into the single life of a touring musician. While his bandmates would often look for the closest bar or club after a show, he'd travel to whatever neighborhood had the best gay bars and party until the sun came up. While out partying, Mercury would dabble with drug use, and especially throughout the 80s, he was known to always have certain white powdery substances that were popular at the time handy. One friend claimed he spent $750 a week on the stuff, but behind all the heavy partying, Freddie still longed to find a loving long-term relationship. He found it hard to balance the desire for both security and freedom, admitting, I want to have my cake and eat it too. But most of the time, on the surface, he kept up his facade of pure swagger. Many bands have had to deal with dueling egos among their members, but Queen always remained remarkably balanced. That is, until they made the album Hot Space. It nearly destroyed the entire band. In the early 80s, Mercury was contemplating reigniting his solo career, and he began working with a manager named Paul Prenter. Printer's attitude and behavior were like that of a bad music industry stereotype. Despite the fact that Queen had radio to thank so much for their success, Printer seemed to try his best to alienate every radio DJ they'd previously worked with. As if that wasn't bad enough, he controlled Freddie and tried to push him away from the Queen band members, even restricting them from seeing the singer. During this period, Mercury had changed his look in a big way, shedding his long locks and glam clothes for a shortcut big mustache, and tight duds. His look reflected a greater trend among gay men. While fans in the UK and Europe barely seemed to blink an eye, with some more amorous female fans straight up ignoring all the signs, Fairweather fans in the US began to turn on the band the more that Mercury played up any hint of sexuality. In 1982, Queen performed in the US for the last time. The disastrous recording of Hot Space and the reaction they faced left Mercury and the band exhausted, and they took some time off. Nine months later, however, they returned to the studio refreshed and ready. Their next album featured the single, I Want to Break Free. For the video, Roger Taylor proposed that they all dress in drag as a parody of the long-running British soap, Coronation Street. While the video was well received in the UK, 
with many fans appreciating its tongue-in-cheek humor, the reaction in the US was chilling. While they didn't outright announce it, behind the scenes, MTV banned the video. It was the final nail in the coffin for Queen's relationship with the US. But that didn't matter because in the UK, they were absolutely golden. Critics hailed Queen's performance at the 1985 Live Aid concert at the highlight of the show, which was one of the most watched TV broadcasts of all time. They were rock royalty, and Mercury had the friends to match. Actress Cleo Rokos introduced Freddie and Kenny Everett to Princess Diana, and they quickly discovered that she had a wild side. One night, the quartet were at Everett's home when they came up with the idea to go dancing at a gay club. They figured that Diana would head home before they went, but they were wrong. She wanted to go too, and although Rokos and Everett warned her of the consequences should the authorities show up, Freddie said, let the girl have some fun. Princess Diana was basically the only star who could outshine Freddie Mercury at a London club in those days, and while he had a good time, the attention in that city grew to be a bit too much. In the mid-80s, Freddie moved temporarily to Munich, where he could still go out and have a good time while keeping a much lower profile. Mercury's close friend, Barbara Valentine, remarked that after a stint in Munich, he was subdued and seemed uninterested in the globe-trotting, hard-partying lifestyle he'd been living up until then. The sad reason why? Well, it's entirely possible that it was heartbreak. While living in Germany, Mercury had been involved with Winnie Kirchberger. It got serious, and Kirchberger even gave Mercury a silver wedding band. It looks like things ended between the pair, however, when Mercury left Germany. But he wouldn't have to wait long to fall in love again. Freddie Mercury knew a good thing when he saw it, and when he saw Jim Hutton, he tried to pick him up. Hutton, who had a boyfriend at the time, said no. But 18 months later, when they met again, sparks flew. They began dating, and within a year, Hutton had moved into Mercury's London home, Garden Lodge. In many ways, Freddie Mercury's romance with Jim Hutton was a fairy tale. In other ways, it was a horror story. In the beginning of the relationship, Hutton would catch Mercury with other men at clubs, and once even at their home. With his physicality, confidence, and star status, Mercury could be intimidating, but ultimately, he just wanted someone to treat him like a normal person, and that's exactly what Hutton did when he told Mercury to make his mind up. Mercury quietly agreed to the ultimatum, and the pair settled back into their lives together. But while their home lives were mundane, Mercury still had a flair for the dramatic. For Mercury's birthday in 1987, it was so massive and wild that the hotel where he held it in in Ibiza still celebrates his birthday annually to this day. For the party, Mercury flew 700 of his closest friends to the small Spanish island. The crazy party came not long after Queen's magic tour. Little did any of them know that it would be Mercury's last. While it may have seemed like Mercury and the band were sitting on top of the world, the singer was hiding a devastating secret. He was sick, and he had been sick for a while. While Mercury didn't receive a definitive diagnosis for years, he began to see doctors about worrying symptoms. At the time, so little was known about HIV and AIDS that people were still calling it gay cancer. The British press reported that Mercury had taken an AIDS test at a local clinic. In an interview, Mercury claimed that he tested negative, but within a year, those close to him began to worry. Valentine had many gay friends, and sadly, had lost quite a few to AIDS. When she noticed dark patches on Mercury's face, a symptom of Carposi's sarcoma, she knew exactly what was happening. Eventually, the patches spread to the rest of Mercury's body, but they weren't simple discolorations. They were quite painful, and Mercury had to take medication just so that he wouldn't be in constant agony. In April of 1987, doctors finally gave Freddy a definitive diagnosis. He had AIDS. When Mercury told his partner, Jim Hutton, that he had AIDS, he said, I would understand if you wanted to pack your bags and leave. He vowed to stand by Mercury and told him that he was in it for the long haul. As AIDS ravaged his body, Mercury grew frail and lost his vigor. After performing for his album Barcelona in 1988, Mercury largely disappeared from the public eye. When he did appear at the 1990 Brit Awards with Queen to accept the trophy for outstanding contribution to British music, fans and critics alike were shocked. Mercury was extremely gaunt and quiet. It would sadly be his last ever appearance on stage. On November 23, 1991, Mercury released a statement that confirmed to the world that he did indeed have AIDS. 
Mercury was bedridden and had lost most of his sight. In his final days, Mercury couldn't leave his bed. Just 24 hours after he released a statement, Mercury died of bronchial pneumonia resulting from AIDS at his home in Kensington. He was only 45 years old. That is going to bring us to the end of the video on Freddie Mercury. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like rating, subscribe for more, and Factinate will be back with a brand new video very soon.